day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's gloomy outside, but it's lovely and warm, and I see lots of smiles. So you folks out in um, online, I hope that you're smiling as well to be able to join us this morning. Our flowers this morning that are beautiful, uh, as always, come from Marianne and Marvin, um, and they are given to the glory of God, and uh, we're grateful for those. Uh, just a couple of announcements, just a reminder that we are, as a congregation, collecting this special offering, Peace and Global Witness, and there's information on the back. There may be still some envelopes floating around in the, uh, pulp, uh, the pews, and the thing about this is this goes to um, the National PCUSA to be used for Peace and Global Witness Ministries, but we keep 25%. And of that 25% that we keep here, we are going to um, use that to help uh, the Mountain Movers, our uh, youth group for fifth through eighth grade kids, uh, trying to get some things for them to uh, kind of uh, make their room a little bit more comfortable for them and kind of make it their own. So uh, this is a, a opportunity to help both the world and our uh, group of uh, Mountain Movers and uh, so if you have any questions, check in with Lexi or um, about the Mountain Mover Group or Leo. Um, you can also um, check with Jane Thorns about this. So there's that. And the other thing is um, they have been moved, but we still have some jars for our um, Operation Christmas Child. Now, if you have coins floating around your house, raise your hand. Okay, great. Here's a place for you to go collect them and put them in one of the jars. So they're currently sitting in the office, but um, we do have more little jars, big jars for you to put, uh, fill with uh, coins of any kind and then bring them back by November 8th. And Jane put the reminder date on there for all of us. So um, take one of those and, and fill that. So two opportunities right now to be able to um, love and serve the world. So wanted to start out this morning with um, our call to worship that is coming to us from Psalm 96, and I'll be reading the first six verses of Psalm 96 as our call to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you please pray with me? We praise you, O oh God. You are wise. You hold both our past and our future. You're in charge of the stars and the seasons, and you're in charge of all creation. Indeed, you're in charge of all of our lives, including this upcoming election. You're in charge because you created us and made us in your image, and we want to give back to you all the praise and all the honor and glory for how you continue to love us, how you continue to bless us and forgive us. And yet we're so like uh, those religious leaders long ago who had hatred in their heart. We wish ill upon those we don't like and fail to recognize our own shortcomings. We're certain in our opinions rather than humble about our assumptions. Lord, we think the best of ourselves and too often the worst of others, despite your admonition to tend to the log in our own eye rather than the speck in our neighbors. We want to partition off our lives and just offer you a little portion of our loyalty, our time, and our resources, and yet you have called us to give our whole selves to you, to put you first in our lives. So Lord, we ask that you forgive our pettiness, our hard-heartedness, our stubbornness, and use our repentance then as a mean for the Spirit to work in us and to remake us into a closer likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray as we give you the 
silent prayers of confession to where we know in our own lives we have gone astray. Friends, the Lord God answers us and forgives us. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Amen. I wanted to share another um, Old Testament reading this morning that comes um, from the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah is um, after the Psalms. And I'm going to be reading out of Isaiah chapter 45, and it's the first seven verses. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. So that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none beside me. I am the Lord, there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring posterity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Amen. At this time when we take an offering, I just really want to say something to you all. I want to say thank you. Thank you, each of you, for being so faithful in sending in your pledges, your contribution, your giving, your donation. And it is it's really because of what you all do that allows our recovery groups to meet here on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. It's you who allow these groups space to help bring wholeness and encouragement to so many different people. It's you who continue to send financial gifts that go out to support our, the Sooner Meal site, to uh, our Presbyterian co-mission workers, uh, to fill the snack packs with nutritional, non-perishable uh, food for the Head Start families provide food for the pantry, and to keep the heat and the lights on. It's all because of you, and I want to say thank you, because this, these are the ways that you all continue the work of loving and serving our community, and we're doing this in partnership with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm just so grateful that as we look back over these last six months, how much you have so strongly continued to support the work of this congregation. And I praise God for your generosity every day. And I praise God for your faithfulness. So now as we are um, taking a moment to give our offering to the Lord, I invite Penny and uh, Mercy to come up and join Marianne. And we'll uh, have a moment of worship. And I know you told me this song and I forgot. He is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. I think that was just perfect. I think we all needed that perfect song this morning. Thank you. Will you please pray with me? Lord of all, we render to you that which is yours, and we recognize that all we have, that all the earth, every fiber of our being and every cell of creation is yours. We can do nothing apart from your presence and power working in us. And so in thanksgiving and joy, we give you this offering. We ask that you bless it and use it for that which will bring you glory and share your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So for the next six weeks, which will be actually bringing us up to just a little after about Thanksgiving, uh, we will be looking at different passages from the book of Matthew as we have been. Uh, we had the last couple of weeks, we had three parables that were challenging uh, to the religious leader. And now we're in chapter 21 and 22. And in these two chapters, different religious groups, Jewish religious leaders um, are asking Jesus questions. And today Jesus answers a question involving government and God. I found that to be very timely. Now, this is what comes out of what we call the um, Revised Common Lectionary. It is a three-year uh, cycle of passages. And so year A just repeats every three years, year B, year C. And so this is just God's timing to bring this to a place where we are about three weeks out from this presidential election. And the debates are raging. So I want you to imagine for a minute that instead of putting Jesus and speaking in a Jewish temple, I want you to imagine him on a debate stage or sitting in place of Judge Amy Barrett before a panel being asked questions. Because in, for this question, Jesus is facing two very strange bedfellows, the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, actually, there's not much known about these Jewish Herodians. Uh, but one thing is very well clear, and that comes from their name, is that they were supporters of the Roman government, which was led by Herod. Pharisees were not the uh, supporters of the Roman government. After all, it was the Romans who had come in and conquered the Jews and taken over their land and then forced them to pay taxes. 
uh, Reverend N.T. Wright noted that when Jesus was a child, there was a man named Judas who started a revolt uh, in that area against paying taxes. To say it didn't go well is not really quite giving you a complete picture because the Roman government crushed so many people and they would set up along the highways uh, they, they would crucify people right on the highway for not paying the tax for being part of this revolt. And so it sent a clear, clear message to anyone who thought that they could be opposing the government that it sent them the message that they were going to be crucified. And so, <laughs> needless to say, they paid their taxes, right? And here we have two very strange bedfellows joining forces to try and trap Jesus into saying something that they can both use to their advantages. So listen now to Matthew chapter 22, uh, verses 15 through 22. Matthew 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what's your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying taxes. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Jesus' final comment is so very clear and simple. His answer is so direct. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what's the, what God's, what is God's. There's really not much to discuss or to debate there. And yet they all went off amazed. And they just walked away from him. And I think what was so amazing and so spectacular was Jesus' deceptively simple answer. It just really shows us how intelligent the man was. His answer didn't give either party an advantage. Neither party could then take his words and turn them and use them against him. He basically said, pay the tax. Use the coin that has the icon of the emperor's head on it. Pay him back. No surprise there. But surprisingly, the Pharisees and the Herodians revealed something about themselves when they gave Jesus that coin. Croyson, in his book, The Last Week, What the Gospels Really Teach Us About Jesus' Final Days in Jerusalem, wrote this. Because remember, this part is all taking place during Jesus' last week of life here on earth. Croyson wrote, in the Jewish homeland in the first century, there were two types of coins. One type, because of the Jewish prohibition of graven images, had no human or animal images. The second type, including Roman coinage, had images. Many Jews would not carry or use coins of the second type. But Jesus' interrogator said the coin they produced had Caesar's image along with the standard and idolatrous inscription heralding Caesar as divine and son of God. See, Jesus' audience they knew the commandment to have no other idol, no other God before God. They knew that the scripture said everything belongs to God. They caught Jesus' unspoken commitment on have, comment on, on having the right priority for their lives. They used the coin that came from Caesar to pay him back and give to the almighty God that which is the Lord's. So basically, I, I think if we just boil it down, we can say Jesus said God first, everything else second. And in this brief answer, I think Jesus points us towards three things. First is to recognize what is God's, to remember who we belong to, 
that we belong to God, and then to reorder our priorities. And so we can begin by asking, okay, well, what does belong to God? Because we, I think, tend to claim ownership. At least I know I do. And scripture says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. Deuteronomy 10, 14 says, look, the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it all belong to the Lord your God. Isaiah 42, 10, God the Lord created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. All this, everything that we can see and even those things which are invisible to us belong to God. And everything even means that governments belong to God. We read in that part in chapter 45 in Isaiah how God anointed Cyrus, even though Cyrus didn't, didn't know God. God worked through Cyrus's government so that others would come to know that there was no other God. And King Cyrus was then the one who allowed the Jewish exiles who had been sent to Babylon, he allowed them to return home, back home. See, that God would work through someone who had no knowledge of the Lord might seem odd to us. But it challenges us, I think, to view everything in a new and different light. When we keep in mind that everything belongs to God, it shifts our perspective. It, this perspective then might challenge us or lead us to question how, how do we view oil pipelines or forest management, personal transportation, recycling, what and, and even how much we buy. It might challenge every decision that both our government and that we make. When we have this perspective, it's going to shift. As Christian citizens, we give to Caesar what is due only to Caesar. And Paul explains how we do this. He, he had a couple of different places where he wrote about how it is that we live in a, under a government. In Romans th chapter 13, verse 1, Paul wrote, Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority, they have been placed there by God. In verse 6 and, six and 7, Paul then went on to write, You also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we're told to do what? We are told to pray for our leaders. And that passage does not say you can pray for the leaders that you support and that you like. It says you pray for our leaders. And in 1 Peter 2, chapter 2, Paul tells us to accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor or as supreme or governors. See, when we give God what's due to God and when the government respects God, then, you know, we're good, right? There's really no conflict. But that doesn't always happen. And this can be a challenging verse and a challenging scripture to live by when governments run amok. And I, I think the, probably the most recent example for those of us, um, and we weren't all alive then, but recently, when, when Hitler came to rise in power in Germany, uh, there were Christians who wrote the Barman Declaration, and it stands against the church joining forces with the government and supporting Hitler because they were seeing that the church was in, connected to the government too closely. And so this Barman Declaration is one that has become well-respected and it's part of our PCUSA declarations. And finally then in 1 Timothy verse, chapter 2, verse 7, he wrote, we are to fear God, honor the emperor. God first, all else second because everything is God's. The Psalm, Psalm 24 says that everything was made by God, and that includes us, includes you and I. We aren't just created like the other animals and the plants in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. So God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Genesis 2, 7 tells us that then the Lord God formed man 
from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Deuteronomy 7, 6, for you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Psalm 100, know the Lord, he is God, it is he who made us, we are his, we are his people, we are the sheep of his pasture. And then the Heidelberg Confession teaches us that our only comfort in life and death is that I belong body and soul in life and death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Our PC USA brief statement of faith begins with these words, in life and in death, we belong to God. God made you, each one of you, God made each one of us, and we belong to God. And the cool thing is, is that God didn't just say, okay, I'm just going to create you and then leave us on to our own doing. Stayed with us. But there's more. And listen to what else God says. Isaiah 54, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. From the apostle Paul, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Each one of us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That comes from 1 John chapter 4. God loves you. Each of us are deeply loved by God who created everything and we each of us you belong to God how amazing is that I think it's almost beyond comprehension on those days when we're just down on ourselves and too often we have those horrible opinions rattling around in our brain about ourselves those internal critic that's that voice that's critical and disparaging and disapproving, those internal voices will say things to us that no human being would ever say to us, and they are not God's words. No, the words that I've just read from Jesus, from Paul, from the prophet Isaiah, all speak of the truth of who we are, each one of us, created and loved by God. Do you know that God loves you? I hope you do. But if not, go back and read the Gospels. Reread Jonah or Job, because God stuck with them and loved them throughout their deep despair and their doubts and their, and their questions. Read Ruth and discover how God, out of love for her, provided for her and her family. Or read the Psalms. Read Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Those are the words that come to us from a loving God, a loving Heavenly Father. You know, I, I could go on, but the whole Bible has been called God's love letter to each one of us. So how do we respond to this great love? The scripture offers many ways to do that, to respond to God's generosity and blessings, but just just one way that we can do that is by reordering our priorities so that God is first and all else is second. Taking a look at Jesus' life, we see that he put certain things first. He put prayer, being with people, listening and sharing meals and serving others first before he did other things. Those seem to be his top five priorities. Following Jesus' priority puts God in first place in our life. In our time, then we put Jesus first, our finances, our energy, activities in everything, and we do it by serving others, spending money to help bring God's kingdom rather than buying another sweater or a toy, spending time supporting and encouraging friends, sharing how God has been in your life and loving you in the hard times and also in the times of joy, by voting reading about what's going on in the world and being involved in the community, bringing justice and praying, praying for others. So when we put God first in our life, then we will care about what God cares about 
We'll care about what breaks God's heart and what brings God joy. We will care about that. And in that way, then we bring back to God that which is rightfully God's. So this week, I invite you to take some time and really take a look at your life and, and recognize what belongs to God. And remember that you belong to God who deeply loves you. And then ask Jesus to help reorder your priorities so that all of our lives put God first and all else second. To God be the glory. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Glorious God, you have created each one of us and you love us beyond measure. There's so many ways that you provide and care and love for us in ways that we don't see or acknowledge. Everything is yours, yet you freely give all of us this life and so much more. Remind us of your call to take care of your world. Help us to understand what it means what we, that we are all made in your image as a coin carries the image of its maker. Let us bear your image wherever we are. Help us accept and believe deep in our hearts and our souls that you love each one of us. And then help us to love others as you love us. Help us to return all of that love and gratitude as you help us reorder our priorities so that you're first and all else is second. Lord, this morning we ask you to watch over our government leaders as we pray for them, for the wisdom, for your guidance. We pray that you will bring peace where there are places of war, and bring our troops, keep our troops safe wherever they are serving, whether they are here in this country or far away. Lord, we continue to boldly ask that you stomp out the coronavirus, which rages around the world. In our hearts, we silently lift up to you those who need to know you, those who are lost, weary, discouraged, and grieving. We pray for those who are suffering pandemic fatigue, those who are sick with COVID, those who continue to need your healing, those who are recovering, those dealing with cancer, we lift up those who are troubled with work issues, those facing transitions in life, and those who weigh on our hearts and minds. We ask you to help us feel your close presence with every breath and each heartbeat. May our awareness of your presence and love empower us to do justice, love kindness, and keep walking with you so that others will come to know you and know your love through us. Lord, we ask that you make us into grateful, joyful people so that we become a light to which others are drawn. In thanks and praise to you, we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning I wanted to close with the uh, Franciscan uh, benediction. May God bless you with discomfort. Discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships. Discomfort so that you will live deep within your heart. 
May God bless you with anger, anger at injustice, oppression, exploitation of people, anger so that you will work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears, tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, starvation, and war. Tears so that you will reach out to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with foolishness, foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, foolishness so that you will do what others claim cannot be done. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen.